I think perhaps it's time we had that talk. You know the one. Yes, there comes a time in every man's life when he has to talk about sci-fi tank design. And for me, it seems that today is that day. And this video, which has been sponsored by Audible, more of that later. Now, um, I'm not going to get tremendously science fiction in this. I'm not going to be talking about oh, you know, teleportation and warp drives and so forth. Uh, instead, I'm going to be keeping it reasonably feasible and reasonably you know, looking into the not too wildly distant future. Um, now, you could say that perhaps the day of the tank is numbered, and you might be right. It could be that there are just too many limitations of tanks, too many things that can knock them out, and uh, perhaps in not many years in the future there will be no tanks. Uh, at the moment, the number of tanks that each uh, of the major warring nations, army having, army, army owning, army using, army having, army mili mili militarized, there you go, go for militarized nations, is actually getting smaller and smaller. Uh, the British now just have one main battle tank, which is what a lot of people have, and one scouty tank, and that's about it. After that, you get into quite specialist vehicles, not really tanks as we know them, you know, the thing with the turret on the top of the big gun. Um, so, uh, the first thing I'm going to talk about, for no particular reason, is sights. Now, um, the, the sight on a tank is quite a sensitive thing, quite a vulnerable thing, and you uh, have to put a hole in the armour of your tank to look through, and every time you put a hole in the armour of your tank, you're weakening your tank. So you want to minimise, if you can, the number of holes you put in, in your tank. So you don't want loads and loads of different kinds of sight. You want all going well, just one sight that does the job. So what should that be? Well, in World War II, towards the end, they were developing infrared sights, and it's a little bit scary. Actually, right at the very end, the Germans had to design for a panther tank with an autoloader and infrared sights, which could have been really, really nasty, but it was okay. It was okay. The war ended. Uh, but I did read in one memoir uh, an infantry battle in which uh, there was a trench that ran across the front of the enemy, and uh, one of the British infantry popped up, this was at night, fired a few rounds, popped down again, moved, as his training at, uh, and experience had told him was a safe and, and sensible thing to do, along the trench for a bit, and then popped up again. And he was immediately shot in the head, much to the consternation of the rest of his fellows around him. How the heck did that happen? It's possible that the uh, sniper, the German sniper, had a night sight. And so he saw the flash, looked through his scope, and then was able to see the head pop up a little way over to the left and got a shot off quickly and accurately. Uh, but anyway, World War II night sights didn't play a huge amount of um, a role. And they were using infrared. Now, infrared is not the future. Um, there are lots of problems with infrared. Uh, for one thing, it's um, you can't use it passively. You have to illuminate the landscape using infrared lamps so that you can see, and that means that necessarily the range is quite short. Plus, if any of the opposition have infrared sensitive equipment, they can see this enormous great lamp on your tank or vehicle or whatever it is illuminating the landscape. So that's not terribly good. Also, infrared is blocked by uh, smoke and so forth. In World War II, uh, tanks fired a lot of illumination rounds and a lot of smoke rounds, but those have both been made pretty much obsolete because of modern sights. So um, we have infrared, which I say is not the future. Uh, we have uh, thermal imaging, which possibly is the future. We've also got image intensifiers. Image intensifiers can work extremely well, and they, like uh, the, th the thermal sites, are passive. You don't have to illuminate the landscape. You can let the, the light that's out there reach your tank and see by that. So you don't give yourself away using it, and it's much potentially much longer ranged. Image intensifiers, though, tend to be extremely big and heavy, um, and that's not likely to change drastically in the near future. Although, of course, you know, they've got little infantry goggles now on, 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 that soldiers can use. So you know, we're, we're getting there. Thermal imaging. Thermal imaging. Uh, just, just a, 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 apropos of nothing, but I just thought this a really cool thing about thermal imaging that I found out. The sites have germanium lenses in them. Now, germanium, you know, it's a metal. You've seen photographs of it. It's just a lump of silvery stuff like almost everything else on the periodic table. But germanium is transparent in infrared light, which means that you can make lenses out of it uh, that uh, when you're using an optical, uh, an optical device that's going to use a sensor which is sensing infrared. So you put your eye, when the machine's not switched on, uh, to the scope and you can see nothing at all because all the lenses are opaque to your human eyes. And yet once the, uh, once the machine is switched on, you can see through all these lenses because they are transparent in infrared. And I just, I don't know, I just thought that, that was interesting. 
Now, anyway, um, the big problem with thermal imaging, however, is that you need to be very sensitive. So if anything out there is emitting any sort of heat signature, you need to be able to pick that up on, in your tank, maybe thousands of yards away. So it needs to be really, really sensitive. But if you've got a tremendously sensitive thing that's in a box that's emitting a lot of heat, looking down a tube, which isn't cold, uh, in the armour of a tank, which isn't cold either, then it just gets blinded by all that. So you have to keep everything really very, very cold indeed. Much, much colder than your fridge at home, using things like, um, they use uh, liquid nitrogen, stuff like that, really, really cold things to keep it super cold so it remains super sensitive. And unfortunately, that again means bulk. But with tanks, that's okay, because you can have a quite a big bulky thing in a tank. So thermal imaging, um, uh, is likely to stick around for some while, I, I think. Um, and you're going to want to minimize the number of holes you put in your tank. Oh, another interesting thing I found out um, is that uh, early gun sites uh, for tanks used a single eye looking down a single tube. And there's a problem with that, which is that your eye is only connected to one half of your brain. So it's not actually connected to your full mental capacity. And they found that if they use binoculars, even ones which um, only actually look through a single hole in the tank. So they're actually, they've got a splitter which looks through the tube. But as long as both eyes are looking through, they've reported a 10 to 15% improvement in uh, crew function, reaction time and, and, and so forth, because of, of that simple thing that you, you're engaging more of your brain by looking th through binocular vision. I'm, it's another sidetrack, sorry. So, um, uh, now, holograms. Holograms might start being used in gun sites. Now, you see, gun sites are very uh, sensitive things. They have these very delicate reticules. And if something like a big shell or bomb hits your tank and gives you a really violent shake, uh, they can be damaged, they can be thrown out of alignment and so forth. Uh, temperature variations, if you're in a desert that's extremely hot during the day and very cold during the night, that can throw your sights out. But a uh, hologram, something like you know, in Star Wars, when they when they have they they have that very extremely low res, don't they? The fuzzy picture of someone uh, who's a long way away, and because that's what the future is going to be like, you know, like Star Wars. Um, in fact, see, most science fiction show show television screens and 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 so forth to be amazingly low res. I mean, far lower res than stuff that actually exists today. But anyway, um, so when you're saying "Help me, Obi Wan Kenobi, you're my only hope," or, or some other excellent piece of dialogue, um, you've got this fuzzy picture of of a hologram. Now imagine some sort of hologram like that, but it's a sight in the uh, in the tank which can't be disturbed by any shaking because it's a hologram that's, that's, that's floating and so maybe uh, that's something which will uh, make sites of the future more robust. Um, there are problems with the glass used in tanks at the moment. Uh, nuclear hardness, as it's known, is, is one problem. You see, ordinary glass, if exposed to a lot of uh, radiation from a nuclear blast, it goes dark. So that's not very good for a gun site, is it? Um, but the trouble is that nuclear hardened glass that doesn't go dark uh, is just a bit rubbish. It's just not very optically good. It's not very transparent. Doesn't make very good lenses. Um, so there's a there's an awkward decision that has to be made there. What sort of uh, lenses are we going to put in our optical equipment? Um, right. Oh, lasers. That's another thing. Lasers. Um, they, they, lasers have a number of limitations. Lasers actually are affected by smoke, um, but lasers could perhaps be used more in the future for blinding enemy crewmen, uh, actually attacking their sights and so forth. But we've got to also imagine. How much longer are tanks even going to have soft, squishy crewmen in them that take up an awful lot of room and have to um, have hatches to, to get in and out of? And, and you know, there, there are loads of problems with having crewmen in the tank. If we, if Google can manage a driverless car, perhaps a top military will sometime in the not very distant future uh, come up with a crewless tank. Now then, uh, guns. Um, guns are in some ways are likely to stay the same. Um, it's very likely that they're going to be just flinging lumps of stuff at each other at high speeds and that that might not change. Uh, to get a, a, a laser that could take out a tank, you'd require so much energy that uh, it's difficult to see where that energy would come from. And again, there, there are other technical problems with lasers. So um, a gun could be powered differently, however. So one possible gun of the future is a liquid powered gun. So instead of uh, a brass shell filled with some solid propellant, which uh, it turns into a gas when it explodes and propels the uh, missile that way. Instead, imagine that you've got a tank to your right, which is filled with some stable liquid that's not going to explode, so you're really quite safe. And to your left is another tank of another uh, stable liquid, which again is not going to explode, so all going well, you're fine. And there are tubes feeding into the breech of your gun, and you put in the warhead, and behind it, into the breech, you inject these two liquids, which then mix and then become an explosive. 
and uh, but they're in a safe position now they're they're in the breach and so they, then you could fire this would apparently lower the amount of wear on the gun uh, and the, the various liquid propellants have uh, been tried uh, they tend to be much louder than solid prope uh, propellants for reasons that i do not understand um uh, but they are a great thing about them is that they're variable you see if uh, the enemy is not very far away or you just want to you want to lob uh, a, a, a shell gently on, on an arc or um, for whatever reason you may want to use a lower power shot so you just inject into the breach just the amount of liquid that you need for that shot and uh, if you need a little bit more range oh let's inject a little bit more you can you can tailor uh, on the fly, you can tailor the amount of propellant and the power of the propellant to the shot that you're just about to do. So as ammunition varies, range varies, the target type varies, you can tailor the propellant to the target. So um, that's another advantage of the liquid propellant. And various armies have tried to uh, develop one of these, and so far none has succeeded. But one day they might. Now another possibility is the electromagnetic railgun. Um, it's possible, uh, well, we know because these speeds of uh, eight kilometers per second for a missile have been achieved already. And we reckon that 10 to 15 kilometers per second is possible. Um, uh, there are still uh, problems with the electromagnetic rail gun, but there are definite advantages too. Uh, stupendous velocities. Uh, the ammunition can be quite cheap, just a lump of iron. Uh, you can achieve very high rates of fire. It might even be possible to have uh, more than one missile traveling up the barrel at the same time um, and uh, so it could be pretty devastating if you can get over some of the problems. Um, the principal problem is power. How do you get enough electricity to power the gun? You need a huge amount and at the moment there is, you know, unless you've, you've got a tank with its own power station uh, going around with it, um, you're not going to get a, a rail gun actually traveling. Uh, it would have to be a very impractically large tank. The amount of electricity you need is staggering way beyond what you could carry in, in, in batteries. And even if you uh, had a really long extension lead, it would have to be very thick cable and that would ha have all sorts of problems and the plug would keep coming out. So at the moment, uh, on a tank, the electromagnetic rail gun doesn't seem that it's about to happen. One uh, idea for conducting the electricity is to use some sort of plasma which sounds great until you realize that the temperatures uh, would go up to something like 20,000 degrees Kelvin which is enough to m melt the barrel and the ammunition and the tank. Um, so uh, the electromagnetic rail gun um, you know it, it's an interesting idea but at the moment the practicalities uh, seem to uh, rule it out but who knows what technologies will, will come along. Um, now uh, very high velocities, this is an extra point, is that very high velocities are not necessarily all that great. You see, if you want to uh, impart a lot of energy to a target, um, what's quite nice is you, you go through the front armor, bang, and then you want the missile to break up and smash around the inside of the tank doing lots of damage. If you've got an extremely hard um, missile uh, and it's going extremely fast what can happen is it goes through one side of the tank out the other side of the tank without actually doing a huge amount of damage to the tank um, it's much better if it breaks up after going through the tank uh, another problem is that it can go so fast that the shell itself doesn't stay together because the hardness of the shell is not great enough to withstand the impact when it hits the target um, I've looked at penetration uh, tables for guns during World War II and this was a problem. You, you, on some tables you, you, you see that this particular gun could knock out this particular tank at this short range and then at a, a bit longer range it couldn't knock the tank out, didn't penetrate, and then it did penetrate again and then it didn't penetrate again. Well, what you, what, what's going on there? How's that possible? Well, um, at very long ranges the, uh, the shell has slowed down so much that it's no longer got enough punch to knock through the armor. At the long-ish range it's still got enough punch to go through the armor. But at this in-between range it's going so fast that the shell itself uh, breaks up. So when it hits the armor it's, it's going uh, fast enough to just break itself and it shatters on the outside of the armor and doesn't penetrate the tank. Um, now it could be of course that we are able to produce more and more and harder and harder ammunition. Um, tungsten ammunition is, is, has been produced and that's one way to make uh, things harder and who knows perhaps there will be a diamond age in the future and some people have predicted that mankind will work out a way of making diamond in large quantities cheaply and then you'll have a, you know, perhaps a diamond warhead with a, maybe a core of lead or something to give it mass and that will be incredibly hard and will be able to withstand 
extremely high velocities and will have hideous penetrative ability. Although, as I say, there's still the danger that you're going so fast and you're so hard that you go all the way through without actually transferring much of your energy to the target. Uh, imagine um, a jelly and you, you fire a, a bullet into the jelly, you will, the bullet will just go all the way through the jelly, doing the jelly not actually all that much harm, and will carry on. You can't shoot a jelly off the table. Um, but if you had a, a bullet that went into the jelly and then slowed down to a halt in the jelly, it would then impart all its, uh, its energy to the, the jelly and perhaps carry it as one great lump sliding the plate off the table and onto the floor. Um, so there you go. Um, it, it's better sometimes to have a slower missile. You don't, you know, there's such a thing as overkill as far as velocity is concerned. Um, now, um, I did say that this was a sponsored video, and it is. It's sponsored by Audible. Now, Audible is a big website online. You can go to it, Audible. and you'll see that it's got loads and loads of audio books, and uh, you can Audible. Uh, subscribe and every month download a book or two and have them playing on some device or other. You know, you have devices, don't you? You you young folk, you have devices. And uh, yes, you can, you can play these things as you're Audible. walking across the park or driving in your car or doing any of the things that you do in your daily lives. And you can listen to all manner of books on all sorts of topics. Audible. Um, I was looking at uh, some autobiographies recently, which I thought were perhaps particularly suited to the Audible, Audible. Book, uh, format, because they tend to be uh, read out, if it's a recent autobiography, by the person who wrote them. And um, Audible. Uh, quite often, I, I think that, that that adds a certain something. So if it's something by Richard Attenborough or David Mitchell Audible. or John Cleese, I saw that they had um, all three of those had, had, had recently read out a book onto tape. It's, it's the authentic voice of that person that you will recognize and when they tell an anecdote it's somehow I don't know I think it's got a bit more power if it comes from from the lips of the person who actually shaped those words uh, that person will I imagine know exactly how to read those words out audible uh, anyway if you uh, click uh, the link which is appearing on your screen now which is www uh, .audible.com stroke Lindy Beige, then you'll be able to go to uh, a, a page on the site where you will find an offer of one free month uh, subscription and you'll get one free book that you can keep forever. It's yours. You don't have to listen to it during that month. It's yours to keep forever, honestly. And um, obviously what they want is that they want you to subscribe and, and, and keep downloading more books. But if you feel that after a month, no, no, you've seen and heard enough, well, then you can just unsubscribe and um, you won't owe them a bean. Um, and uh, there's a link in the description which you can click on as well, which is uh, slightly easier than typing in this address. So there you go. Audible. Now, I was talking about tanks, if you remember. And uh, something that I've not uh, discussed is how tanks move around. Now, at the moment, the standard tank moves around on tracks, and that might not change because tracks work really well. Uh, they spread the load uh, very well. They've got extremely good grip. Uh, they transfer the power of an engine very efficiently. Uh, they are like laying your own little roads, so they're good for uh, cross country. They're good for soft ground and hard ground. Tracks are really good. Um, and it's though it's possible that in the future they will develop legs for walking tanks that they've already got to robots uh, that can walk the, the, the dog sized and, and horse sized but the amount of energy it takes to walk something that's really big now we're talking about tanks remember so we're assuming that it's a tank as we imagine a tank a really heavily armored thing so it's going to weigh an awful lot and an awfully heavy thing that's rolling along on wheels uh, can be moved much more easily than something that has to be moved on legs. Uh, you know this, don't you? If you've ever pedaled a bicycle, it's a lot less tiring than, say, running. Um, and so the engine required of a really big tank and the amount of fuel it would go through if you want to put it on legs um, at the moment seems to rule legs out. But who knows? Again, in the future, new technologies might come in and legs might become feasible. Um, now, there are uh, two other things I wanted to make, uh, points I wanted to make about the movement of sci-fi tanks. Um, the first is to do with what's known as drive ratio. Sorry, steering ratio, steering ratio. Now, I read a book on tank design some while ago and it pointed out that there's actually a very narrow, um, uh, a very narrow range of ratios between the distance between the tracks and the length of the track in contact with the ground that actually work. Other tanks you know, that, that, that break these rules, that go outside the, the, this range of ratios, have been tried and they have been shown not to work. So, um, in, in short, uh, this is the shortest, fattest tank that you can get away with, whereas this 
This is the longest, thinnest tank that you can get away with. You've got a bit of wiggle room because, of course, uh, the, the length of these tracks is the length in contact with the ground. So you can have a bit of overhang at the front and back, but you can't have too much. Um, now, if you imagine an extremely long, thin tank with uh, tracks that are quite close together, uh, that will be really good at going straight forwards. It'll be able to go straight forwards in a very stable manner. But as soon as it tries to, uh, say, turn left, this side, the tracks on this side, will accelerate and will try to... Oh, my goodness, the friction, the sideways friction of trying to get these tracks to oh, turn like that is absolutely horrendous. So it, it, it handles extremely badly, puts a huge amount of strain on the tracks and wheels, and quite often, ping, something somewhere gives, and um, you come to an embarrassing halt. Um, so, obviously, you, you make your tank a bit stubbier and wider, and hey, hey, why don't make it really stubby and really wide, so you've got quite short tracks uh, either side of you. Well, then you've got the opposite problem. You have a really unstable, whoa, whoa, tank that every bump it goes over, throws the whole tank out horrendously, and it's really difficult to keep stable that way. People have tried, and they have found that 1.5 to 1.8 to 1, that's the range you've got to work with. And if you look at a lot of sci-fi tank designs that I've seen in classic games, like, for instance, Steve Jackson's Ogre, uh, which is it's a good game. Hey, I'd recommend it as a game, but... Um, when you look at some of their pictures of tank designs for the future, you'll notice that they're breaking this uh, ratio rule. And I've seen so many tanks that when I look at these sci-fi tanks, immediately I get the feeling of wrongness about them. That, that one's too long and thin, or, or this one's just too short and fat. It wouldn't work. Though an interesting thing I've noticed with a lot of these futuristic designs, including some of the uh, ogre tank designs, is they've split the tank into two. Uh, although actually I think they split them into two in a way which still wouldn't work. But you know, it was an interesting idea and with slightly different ratios and a different uh, central hinging mechanism, perhaps that could be got to, to work. It still wouldn't be a wonderfully maneuverable tank though. Uh, so there's another possibility, the hover tank. Oh yes, we've all designed a hover tank, haven't we, on our, in, our, in our sketchbooks at school during a particularly boring maths exam uh, or lesson. Uh, don't, don't sketch during exams. Take the exam seriously, kids. Education. Uh, but uh, anyway, um, there are problems here too. Now, some of you have perhaps lived all the way through the James Bond film Die Another Day, in which case, well done. And uh, you may remember uh, that there's a sequence in the beginning of that, a big action opening sequence, in which our hero uh, is chased in a military armoured hovercraft by lots of other military armoured hovercrafts. Uh, the plan, you see, the, the, the dastardly North Koreans have decided that they will be able to hover over the huge minefield separating North and South Korea harmlessly because they have hover tanks you see and these will pass harmlessly over the the mines which of course are all designed to uh, to be set off by heavy tanks and other vehicles going across them but these hover things will just hover over hardly even touching the ground won't set off any of the mines and no that that doesn't work that doesn't work think about it the mine is set off if force is pressed down into the ground which triggers the mine okay so how is the hovercraft actually lifting off the ground it's exerting downward force, isn't it? An awful lot of downward force. In the, in, now, I grant you that the, the, the area that that force is being pressed down uh, over uh, is larger, perhaps, than a tracked vehicle, but it's still got to be... If you've got a very large armoured hovercraft full of men and weapons and so forth, it's still going to be very heavy, and it's going to be exerting a lot of downward pressure on the, uh, on, on the ground. So it was still going to set off mines. Plus... Even if those mines, some of them have been calibrated for the tracks of a heavy tank, you lay a mixed minefield. There will be mines that are calibrated to be triggered by lighter vehicles, by infantry and personnel. So, uh, infantry is personnel. But anyway, so um, that wouldn't work. That was a silly idea. And the hover tank has a number of uh, other problems. For instance, uh, one of the principal reasons that the tank was designed in the first place was to cross trenches. Now, uh, if you're on a nice flat surface, like, for instance, a calm sea, hovercraft work really well. They're, they're very efficient and they, they glide with very low friction, whee, across the surface of the sea. But if you're trying to cross a trench, the downward uh, air um, goes into the trench, then sideways and off. It's not supporting you anymore. So as you were uh, going over a trench, you would just go, zh, boom, and zh, you wouldn't get over a trench. So one one trench would protect uh, uh, South Korea from North Korea um, in combination with these minefields. So yes, they don't cross uh, mines and they don't cross trenches. So that's two really big disadvantages. They're also pretty rubbish at going up, you know, um, a parapet. If there's, if there's a, a low wall or something that you want to go over, a hovercraft is not going to do that terribly well. Um, now there are, of course, sci-fi 
hover tanks, which don't have a bag of air with skirts, which is holding in this high pressure uh, area of air underneath the, the, the tank, which is holding it up. And instead they have other things, sort of weird glowing things, repulsors or whatever you want to call them, just that are somehow repulsing the ground and uh, causing the, the tank to, to hover in a sci-fi way. Well, great, um, but presumably they're still using ground effect. Um, imagine you're in a helicopter. If you're flying in, in the air, you're just pushing air downwards beneath you and that's what keeps you going up. But as you come down to the ground, that air is now being pushed into the ground and it finds it quite difficult to get out of the way because the ground is really solid. And um, that means that you get what's called ground effect. You actually get more lift when you're very close to the ground. Uh, so that's one of the things which make landing a, makes landing a, a helicopter a little bit more challenging because you get get nice and low, you're descending at just the rate you want, and then, oh, suddenly you're not descending anymore because the ground effect kicks in. Well, if the ground effect is required to hold the tank off the off the deck, then again, you've got problems doing things like going over trenches. But if you don't need the ground effect to suspend the tank, if you're able to push downwards with these repulsors or whatever they are with enough force so that you can actually rise upwards, well, then what you've got isn't really a tank. It's an aircraft. You're flying. Um, so yes, a heavily armoured aircraft is what you've got then with, with a, a turret which will sort of unbalance it a bit. Uh, it's not a terribly... Why not just have an aircraft? I, I have an aircraft. If you can generate that amount of repulsive power so that you can... Repulsive power? I like the idea of that. Ooh, that's repulsive power. Um, that you can fly through the air in a very heavily armoured vehicle. Well, do that then instead. That'll probably be better. So um, I'm not convinced by the hover tank. Um, and when you watch the James Bond movie, uh, you may notice that uh, this, this, this movie does actually bring to our attention some other drawbacks of the hover craft as a tank. Uh, you see, if in the future we still live in a world uh, which has things like mass and momentum in it, and I, I think that's uh, likely to be the case, uh, well, the hovercraft, when it's going forwards that way really fast, and isn't it great that they can go so fast, because uh, speed's very useful for a tank, um, uh, you may be interested to learn that uh, in Europe the uh, tank target is typically exposed to fire for between 15 and 25 seconds. That's how long you've got to see it, acquire it, um, loading the right ammunition, get off an accurate shot against it. So obviously if it can go faster, it will be exposed for a shorter amount of time. It's going to be more difficult to hit. So speed is great. So there you are zooming along in your hover tank, but you're a tank still. You've got lots of armor, so that means you've got lots of mass. So you then turn your hover tank and you try to go that way, but you've still got an awful lot of momentum that way. And uh, rather amusingly, in the film, you'll notice that whenever a hovercraft tries to make a, a, a sudden turn, the editor always cuts at that point. It's, and then in, in the, the later, later shots that we see in the sequence, it's now turned the corner and is going off in the, in the new desired direction. It's almost as though what actually happened is it went that way, turned, and then carried on going that way. They said cut, and then whoo, eventually brought it to a halt, and then brought it back, and then OK, forwards, and OK, and turn over, next shot, great. And then they cut the two shots together. I think that might have happened. So there you go, a few thoughts about sci Fi tanks. I've talked about sights, I've talked about guns, I've talked about um, movement, and so there you go, tanks. They're great. <laughs>